that project is premised on the idea that law matters, that law promotes economic development, and that it does so by facilitating certain key types of economic transactions, like collecting on a debt, right, or registering a transfer of property, right, or cro uh, moving goods across borders, or starting up a business. And so what the creators of this project have done is they've gone out and surveyed lawyers in 181 countries around the world on exactly what would be involved in, in collecting on a debt or starting a business in their country. What procedures are involved, how long would it take, how much would it cost? Right? So that's the data collection part of the exercise. But then they've gone on and not just compiled the data, but encouraged countries to try to reduce the amount of time it takes, reduce the number of procedures it takes, reduce the cost of undertaking each of these transactions, to reform their legal systems, to make it faster, cheaper, and simpler to do these things, right? And so they do think, they, they will, they've, um, they rank countries in terms of their success on, their, on these criteria. They produce an ease of doing business index and rank countries according to that. They pu have publications, annual publications, that highlight the 10 best performers, right? Countries that have reformed and uh, as evidenced by their moving up the rankings on these scores. Right? And they publish little case studies highlighting the reforms. So I think it's pretty clear, even without this quote, that they do think there is a way to do business law, right? And a way to get it right. And it's this one size, it is a one size fits all claim. Now this is more sophisticated than the common law claim because it's, not, it's a functional claim. It's saying that you have to have laws that function in a particular way, achieve a certain result. They're not laws, you don't have to give them a particular name, right, or draft them in a particular way. All that matters is the functional, um, their functional attributes. Right? But I still think this falls afoul or runs aground of the same objections that I identified. First of all, the normative claim. Let's take what they say about the law of secure transactions, just to pick an example, again, that I'm somewhat familiar with. Um, the doing business folks say that it should be as easy as possible to take a security interest, right? A mortgage over someone's property, personal property. You should be able to take it over as broad a range as, of property as possible, and if the debtor goes into default, you should be able to move in without going to court first to seize and sell the, the, the property. And your claim to the proceeds of that property should take priority over the claims of all other creditors, right? including employees and the tax collectors. Right? So those are the hallmarks to them of an optimal secure transactions law. Right? That makes it as quick and as easy and as cheap as possible for secured creditors to enforce their rights. Right? And you can see that that's appealing, to, would be appealing to them. But I think there's also a question of values there. If you care about just the cost of credit, minimizing the cost of credit, making things as easy as possible for secured creditors, that's the law you want. But if you care about things like due process for debtors, right, or protecting the interests of less sophisticated creditors like the employees who don't know that the, their, country, their company is about to go bankrupt, right, and can't adjust the, way they the terms upon which they deal with the company to reflect the risk of bankruptcy, then you might make a different choice. Right, and those are philosophical disagreements that I think different countries and different societies might uh, come out on uh, uh, in different directions. Right. So that's the normative claim. The claim about, uh, about substitutes, why they might matter. Um, another story. Couple, uh, last year, I guess it was, I was teaching in Singapore, a very, to, to a very international group of students, LLM students, and I was talking about this material. And so I would, I asked them to look at, each of them to look at the data from their home country to tell me how accurate it seemed. And a lawyer, a student who had been a practicing lawyer in Uganda, actually got quite irritated with what the project, with what the report was saying about her country, because it said that it took 30 days to start up a business in Uganda. And she said, that's crazy, right? You know, what it turns out what they'd done was they'd looked at how long it would take a lay person acting without a lawyer to go through all the steps required to set up a business. But what she was reacting to was the fact that when she was in practice and tried to do it for her clients, it would take her two or three days because all the lawyers in Uganda knew one another. They'd all gone to school with one another, including the officers, uh, lawyers in the registry office. And when they wanted to set up a company, they'd just call up their friend in the registry office and have them expedite the, 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 the file, right? 
two or three days, even less, they're done. Right? There was an easy workaround, an easy su a readily available substitute for the formal procedure that the doing business uh, report was documenting. And of course, the, the upshot of all the other activities that the World Bank engages in is that countries like Uganda should do their best to reduce the amount of time that it takes to go through the formal procedure. Right? But my point would be, well, it's not clear that's worthwhile if it's pretty cheap to get, a, if it's cheap enough to get a lawyer who can get it done for you, you know, as a, and use that substitute mechanism instead of revamping the formal mechanism, why not save the money and, you know, invest in AIDS education or something like that. Right? As for the compliments, um, yet another anecdote. Um, there was a brief period of time when the US government actually thought it had something to brag about in Afghanistan. Um, <laughs> the, the, what, what they were proud of was the fact that USAID, the US aid organization, had um, helped usher in a set of reforms that dramatically reduced the amount of time it took to start up a business, down to nine days actually, which is very good on the international scale. And so they were going around the world, you know, touting a Afghanistan as an, a, as an example of a rapid reformer. Right? Eventually, the Afghan lawyers and business people asked them to stop that. <laughs> uh, because it was true that it only took nine days to get the business set up, right, registered. But it still took another year to get it operating because all the delays, all the corruption had been shifted to the licensing stage. And so, you know, in this case, the point would be that without a complementary, efficient licensing procedure, the reforms that uh, in influenced the, uh, that improved the process for registering the business were of limited value. I'm not saying they were of no value, but the impact was, from the perspective of these Afghan business people, was clearly somewhat limited. Right? Okay, so that's the second example of a universalist theory. If you'll bear with me, I just want to talk about one more example, just to bring the point home, because the last example is even more sophisticated, and I think me, perhaps even more appealing than, initially appealing than the, um, the doing business theory. Um, this is the one that I call the experimentalist approach. Right? The claim here um, is that we should govern by experiment. We should only make laws after running experiments that are designed to ascertain their likely impact. And I don't mean just sort of natural experiments where you look at past experience to try to figure out, well, what happens if you change your bankruptcy law or anything like that. I mean controlled experiments, randomized trials, just like we use for clinical, um, the, the, just like we use for drugs, right? And the claim is that we should run randomized trials to test the impact of any particular legal reform before we implement it, right? Now this has become this claim that we should use randomized trials to evaluate the effects of various types of policy intervention has become quite um, common in the development literature and the education literature where you know you can test the impact of giving um, mothers um, uh, cash subsidies, ca cash transfers conditional upon them uh, uh, monitoring their child's attendance and so forth or giving nutritional supplements right, or you giving teachers flip charts. But now the claim that you're starting to see being made is that we should do this for legal experiments as well, for legal interventions as well. Right? And so the quote I took here is from a paper by Ian Ayers and Yair Listigan, um, who are two professors at Yale Law School, who were not writing in the development context. They were actually advocating this for the United States, I think. Right? They didn't specify, but I presume it's for the United States. And I'm not sure that they intended to apply it to the entire world, so don't, I don't want to attribute that view to them. But I think this is what we might what might be coming down the turnpike, right? The claim that experimentalism is the way to go, right? And it has obvious attractions, right? So just to, in terms of how this would work, since I, I should maybe explain that. The idea would be that, say you want to figure out whether a new bankruptcy law makes sense, right? A law that would give debtors more breathing room to reorganize their debts, right? Before the creditors can come in and shut them down. What you'd do is pick one, say, one-tenth of the firms in the economy and say, you're now subject to this new bankruptcy regime. Right? And force them into it, because otherwise you'd have a selection effect. And then you wait and see how they perform, right? what their cost of credit would be, right? whether they grow as rapidly as other firms, what if they go into bankruptcy, 
how long it takes to get through the process, how much it costs, 